Kia ora everybody. Uh, tēnā tata, no mai, rarau mai ki tēnei hōtaka. Welcome everyone along to this session today. We trust you enjoyed some of yesterday's webinars in this series, Tereziu Based Futures Anti-Racism 2020, to mark International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, we're here today with Dominic Sullivan and hopefully Claire Charters. She is having some uh, trouble with her connection. Um, having had to travel away um, in relation to COVID-19. So no mai, haere mai, we're going to try and do the best we can given some of the challenges we have today with our connection. Uh, so this session is on the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and we are lucky to have some experts um, discussing that with us today. And also we know that some of you out there uh, are quite familiar with this topic as well. So we really do um, welcome some questions and some discussion points from even any of you. Uh, this is a fireside chat, and so it's a little bit more informal than some of the other sessions you may have seen yesterday, which were uh, formal presentations. So in a fireside chat, we really would like um, some good interaction with our, our attendees. So feel free to fire off some questions to us. Firstly, my name is Papa Tuan Kunahi, uh, no te notaho, no ngapuhi, and I will pass it over to Dominic now to give us a brief introduction. Kia ora, Dominic. Kia ora, uh, Papa. Uh, kia ora, Kaitau. Uh, ko te mea tutahi, e mihana ki te rungarawa, i o matua kore, he honore he karore ki tana ingoa, he maunga rungo ki te whenua, he whakaaro pai ki ngā tangata katoa. Uh, ko... Uh, <coughs> um, ko Māori te waka, ko te rarua te iwi, ko te uri o hina te hapū, ko te uri o hina te marae. Ko Dominic O'Sullivan nga uh, hau. Uh, morning everybody, my name is Dominic O'Sullivan. I'm um, an Associate Professor of Political Science at uh, Charles Sturt University and I'm based on the Canberra premises of, of that university in Australia. And um, um, among other things, I um, have a, a research interest on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, and look forward to discussing it with you today and, and hopefully receiving lots of questions. It's a little bit disconcerting not knowing who I'm talking to or indeed how many people I'm talking to, apart from, from Papa, who I can uh, see here in, in, on my computer screen. Um, so if, if there's anybody there, I'm assuming we've got at least some, some people attending, um, it, it'd be great to hear your questions and, and comments, and hopefully uh, Claire Charters will be uh, joining us shortly. Um. Kia, ora, kia ora, Dominic. Um, thank you, and good to hear your whakapapa links as well. I'd like to uh, also acknowledge the, the organising committee of this uh, webinar series, uh, to Heather Kame and your, your co-organisers, uh, Tine te mihi atu ki uh, and also to the sponsors of this series, um, who are really important. Uh, although we are still waiting for Claire, I did want to um, kick us off, and I'm just having a look at some of your the re responses out there. So, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou e, e whakarongo mai ana. Uh, firstly, Dominic, um, I thought it might be good for, for us all to understand a little bit more about your background, uh, and we will go back quite a way. Um, could you let us know some of the things that influenced you on your career pathway? Well, I, I guess a, a fascination with politics for, for as long as I can remember. And a fascination with how political systems work and how they don't work uh, for some people vis-a-vis -vis other people. And... Um, it always intrigued me as a, um, a teenager, I suppose, um, you know, growing up in the 1980s when there was uh, a, a lot of talk about uh, the treaty, biculturalism was becoming uh, fashionable. And um, I, I could see the point of all these discourses, but I could also see the, the limits that they um, took us one step forward, but not necessarily two steps forward. And um, 
I, I guess there are, you know, many, many ways in which one might explain uh, that phenomenon. And, and um, my second book, actually, Beyond Biculturalism, was um, a, a study of, of, of some of those phenomena. And um, my interest in these matters really just continued from there. And um, one of the interesting things, too, I think, is when, you know, the, the draft declaration came out um, so, some years ago now and um, became quite influential in um, some of the discussions going on among Indigenous peoples around the world. Um, I, the question arose for me, well, how does this um, fit in with the treaty, for example? Does it add to it? Does it contradict it? Does it displace it? All those sorts of, of things that uh, I, I thought were quite interesting. And um, interesting also in the specific context of New Zealand having developed as a, as a liberal democracy. So how do the ideas in both the treaty and in the um, declaration fit with prevailing ideas of, of democracy and <coughs> and sovereignty as they're understood in a place like New Zealand, but also as they're understood in, understood in Australia, where I've lived and worked for the last 12 years, and uh, re really just by way of comparison also in, in Canada. So that's where my current interests come from. I have a, a book coming out with the Australian National University Press in hopefully in about August or September on the um, declaration, and that book, really looks at what the declaration means for the ways in which states like New Zealand, Australia and Canada actually work, how the politics of those states operate and what kind of difference we might expect the declaration to make for Indigenous peoples as they negotiate that political world. Fantastic. Kia ora, Dominic. Now, I want to um, pass it over to Claire. Thank you, Claire. I'm, I'm so glad we're able to have you along. Claire, could you introduce yourself firstly to our audience and then uh, perhaps give us um, a base understanding of what the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is about? Kia ora, Claire. Kia ora koutou, nā, uh, no uh, Ngāti Whakauwe aho, ko Ngāti Whakauwe tainui tu wharetua oku iwi, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm also an Associate Professor at the University of Auckland in law. Um, and just briefly before I outline, uh, I think the question was what, what the declaration is about. Um, just to complement uh, Dominic's quote at all, which I've been listening to. Um, so my interest came um, from, I guess, being involved as a kid watching um, political movements um, to try and seek uh, redress for um, harms, particularly in Te Arawa, um, in Ngāti Whakauwe, um, and then as a student at university in the late 90s, uh, when the declaration was going through, I guess that's where my interest started. And I, um, when I left university in 1998, I spent time in Geneva, and my uh, involvement with the declaration started then, so including in the negotiation process. Um, and then ever since then, I guess it's been probably the centre of uh, my intellectual but also political um, and in many ways personal world um, being involved in that international movement for some time. So Papa, I think um, your part I was around um, what it is about the Declaration, was it? Yes. And what, and what it does. So um, I guess at the heart of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples are uh, rights to self-determination um, and rights to lands, territories and resources there are, of course, rights uh, to culture, um, rights uh, to non-discrimination, for example. Um, and yeah, so it's a, it's a fairly comprehensive document, but I think the key really is, is self-determination in lands, territories and resources. Um, so very strong on um, ensuring that Indigenous peoples have got um, self-determination in, in different ways. Um, that can either be autonomous, um, uh, governmental activity or rights to participate in the state, um, which is more important, I think, for some other Indigenous peoples. Um, and then lands, territories and resources. So rights to all uh, 
Indigenous people's land streets and resources, including those that have been, for want of a better word, uh, lost in the, in the past. Um, rights to culture um, go to schooling, education, to health, uh, to um, all aspects of life, I think, um, and non-discrimination, so there's bits there about um, in the workplace and so on. It's a really comprehensive document. It's the most comprehensive um, document um, around the rights of Indigenous peoples um, that, that exists. Um, yeah, and it's a human rights document. And just to introduce as well um, who I am, sorry, the most recent thing that um, I've been involved is, is chairing New Zealand's um, uh, declaration working group, which was set up by government with a mixture of Māori and uh, government officials. Um, and we finished our report in, on the 1st of November last year, and that's with Cabinet um, at the moment, and that tries to give New Zealand, um, uh, I guess, a blueprint for what um, New Zealand should be doing to realise the declaration in the future. But it's under wraps until Parliament's considered it, so I can't talk to, in too much detail about that, but generically I think it's probably fine. That's fantastic. Um, Claire, it's really good to hear um, some current um, progress and work around the declaration and uh, particularly uh, at the national level. Um, and just for our listeners, um, kia ora June and kia ora Heather, thank you for listening in and Bridget as well um, and many others. Uh, just to let you know a bit of the structure of how today's session is going to go, um, we, we've started on some of our introductory comments um, then we're going to look at how the declaration is used, um, what is its relationship is with other documents, for example, Te Reti Watani and some other um, United Nations documents. Uh, then we'll be taking some questions from um, our audience and we'll be concluding with um, some of the current work that um, Dominic and Claire are involved with and some final um, final comments and also some links to some key documents and perhaps their books as well. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to pick up, and I might just pass to you, Claire, even though I said I'd have a, the same order every time, is um, some of the challenges getting the uh, declaration over the line. Could you talk, talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, so oh, there was there were there were many, <laughs> um, but particularly around self determination and land territories and resources, there were. Um, a number of concerns from states. So New Zealand was one of the four who voted against the, the declaration um, going through the GEA General Assembly um, initially. Um, and it was concerned about the breadth of self-determination. It was about how that, I guess, probably would challenge state governance. Um, it was concerned about the extent of rights to lands, territories and resources and took a very kind of, I think, I thought at the time alarmist view, um, and I think at one point um, argued that it would mean that all of New Zealand had to be returned to Māori, which is not exactly what it said. So, um, so the, the challenges were were those um, for that they were different from from state to state, of course. So some states like the US had less problem with self-determination because they recognise inherent sovereignty of Indigenous peoples um, and have those kind of Right, so their concerns related more to um, lands, territories and resources. For then um, a number of African states, it was how it would apply in a context where many or most groups, um, even those associated with the state, claim to be Indigenous. So who was Indigenous in those states? So the, the concerns or the, the difficulties were really getting something strong through. Um, and trying to allay the fears of, of states. Um, yeah. yeah. Dominic, did you have anything to add to that about the challenges getting over, over the line? Well, I, I think that's a, a good summary. And now I think we move to the challenges of, of getting it implemented. And, um, you know, <coughs> we, we, we use the word sovereignty uh, rather loosely, I think, and therefore some people find that a, a very threatening term. And one of the things I'm interested in is, well, well why is that? And um, 
is, is it fair to char characterise it in, the, in those ways? Especially as we consider things like the Waitangi Tribunal's finding in 2014 that um, Ngāpui didn't cede sovereignty to the British Crown. Well, um, what does that mean? What, what is the political authority embodied in sovereignty that wasn't ceded? And what does that mean for how politics works today? And um, how, how does that relate to the right to self-determination? And, um, you know, there were concerns, I think, when the declaration was being discussed that self-determination meant a right to secede from the state. And, um, you know, that, that was clarified during the discussions that that's not, not what it meant. Um, and, and, and one of the things the declaration does to, to satisfy that concern is uh, affirm um, the, the, the territorial integrity of an existing states. But that, to me, doesn't mean that there can't be a sovereign Indigenous authority within those states as part of those states. And I think the declaration provides some, some ways of, of, of thinking about that. And I, I, I think, um, you know, there, there are all sorts of rights that iwi, for example, and hapu retain, and those are set out in the declaration. But that question of, of participation within the state, I, I think is, is really important for New Zealand as much as it's important for some other places, because, you know, for example, we've had guaranteed Māori representation in Parliament since 1867. Um, we've routinely had a, a good number of, of Māori in the, the Cabinet, for example. Um, yet we still find, as, as the Tribunal's looking at at the moment, um, huge health discrepancies and breaches of the Treaty are, are cited in, in many respects as factors that, that explain that. So that says to me that in spite of that presence in Parliament, in spite of that uh, presence in, in the executive, um, participation within the state is not as strong as it ought to be. Um, something's going wrong somewhere, whether it's on the, the hospital floor, among the street level bureaucrats, perhaps making choices in terms of the care that they provide to Māori patients vis-a-vis -vis others, whether it's policy makers sitting in their in, in their offices in, in, in Wellington, um, in, uh, developing policy from a, a detached perspective, one might say. So there are all those little bits of participation in the state that are not working terribly well. And working out exactly what those are and um, claiming that they're not, I mean, they're, they're very importantly treaty rights, of course, but they're also very importantly um, international rights, and that's where the declaration is important. It means that, um, you know, we, we can make claims to a, a state that works better, to simplify it, um, with reference to the international authority that the declaration embodies. And I, I think that's, that's really important, whether we're talking about health or, or schooling or um, racism and, and policing or, or whichever bits of the state we might be talking about, that international authority that we can claim is um, very important, I think. I want to get to um, how we draw on the declaration at a national level uh, in terms of Indigenous advocacy. Uh, we have some questions here, one from, uh, is it Sturridge, um, who is wanting uh, your definition of sovereignty. Um, can I start with Geoffrey Palmer's definition, which is that it's like a piece of chewing gum and can be stretched in all sorts of directions to mean whatever you want it to mean, and therefore it is a, a, a useless term. I, I understand where that's coming from, but I, I tend to disagree. My very simple definition would be that sovereignty is political authority. Mm. And um, from that, one obviously needs to look at the nature of authority, where it comes from and why, what makes authority legitimate, what makes it illegitimate, and how different bodies of authority interact with, with others and, and so on. So yeah, my very short definition of sovereignty is political authority. And maybe that's not such a, a threatening term for, for some people, um, which is interesting. <laughs> 
Claire, did you have anything to add to that before we go to looking at how the declaration is used? Sure. I, sure. Just on the question of the sovereignty, um, I agree with much of Dominic's sort of sentiment. Um, from a Westminster perspective, um, sovereignty has got some specific meanings, um, at least historically, and that is that legal sovereignty is full and absolute, complete authority and, and power to make laws and govern um, a, a territory. At least that's one one concept of sovereignty that was alive not long after Te Tiriti was um, signed, and is the cause I think at least from if not at 1840, but certainly by the 1860s that understanding of sovereignty um, has been a cause of some problem because it doesn't permit <laughs> any other sort of legal authority. And this is more of a legalistic um, understanding of sovereignty, which you might expect from someone who's trained in the law. Um, but that's, I absolutely agree with um, uh, Dominic that that might not be the same thing as political sovereignty and certainly there are, Sir Geoffrey Palmer's point, there are certainly lots of different understandings and it is an elastic concept in everyday parlance, but there is that, there is that traditionally that legal understanding and then there's political sovereignty versus legal sovereignty um, as, as well, which is, is something different. So you could argue that the English um, at some point, in the, at least from the 1860s onwards, came with an understanding of this legal sovereignty. It had absolute and full power, and that's what at least the English version of Tativity transferred to it, um, which is very contested, but at least that it was some understanding, versus political sovereignty, which probably transferred, if it ever has, and certainly not fully, um, to the British Crown at some later point, and that's that is a reflection more of what's happening on the ground and who is who has an actual fact power, <laughs> and mm -hmm. by that I, I actually literally mean um, uh, the, the, the 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 power of people and and, and war basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's lots of different understandings, and I would agree with most of Dominic's, but the, the legal understanding has has been quite particular at certain points of time. There's there's also then the relationship with. Uh, democracy in, in more recent times, but yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's important to make that distinction between the way lawyers speak of sovereignty and the way political scientists might use it more broadly, perhaps. Um, I think from a political perspective, one could say that there's, there's no such thing as absolute power, because all power is relative and relational to the power of others. Uh, relative and relational to all sorts of circumstances beyond our control. Um, you know, the coronavirus, for example, diminishes all of our power in, in many respects. Um, states are really not in control of their borders at the moment, um, rather than, you know, having a sense of allowing people to freely move. Uh, that just can't happen. Um, and nobody really contests that. Um, so there are a natural phenomenon as well as political phenomenon that can constrain power. So it's never, never absolute, but um, obviously there are possibilities of exercising power in um, ways that might be right and just, but are not available um, to some groups of people because of the ways in which other people exercise their power. And um, that's, of course, when we get political conflict. So I think it is important when we're, we're reading about these things and talking about them that we recognise that sovereignty is used um, in different ways by different people for different purposes. And it would probably be unfair to say that there's a, a single absolute incontestable definition. And, and it's really important, I think, in our, today's discussion to have uh, perspectives from you know, multiple perspectives. So that's, um, we, we appreciate having um, both of you on coming from different perspectives on this on these matters. Uh, and uh, we've got lots of discussion um, and interest from our audience. Uh, and in terms of this recording, it will be available um, on the YouTube uh, channel for the webinar series later on. So we'll make sure to share that. Now, I did want to go to um, some of the uses of the Declaration by Indigenous Peoples. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a change from our current discussion on sovereignty. 
but um, I'm wondering if both of you could give us some examples of how uh, Indigenous peoples around the world have drawn on the Declaration successfully to affirm their rights um, and, and give us a range of ways in which that has happened. Perhaps we can start with you, Claire. Yeah, kia ora. So, um, as you know, <laughs> um, starting with Aotearoa, Māori have used the declaration in multiple ways. So to, uh, for example, bring international pressure with respect to specific issues, but also general issues. So more generally around Māori health. Uh, for example, if you're trying to get the government to um, implement a certain policy or to pay more attention to Māori health, there's been um, uh, inter interventions, I guess, with what's called international human rights treaty bodies using the declaration to say, put pressure on the government. So then you get the UN responding, um, saying to New Zealand government, it should do X, Y, Z. Um, so that's one way. With respect to specific issues, so um, the declaration has been used again before for um, what's called the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and before um, treaty bodies with respect to Ihi Matau as well, which is part of the pressure. So it's maybe not the whole story about what's happened with, with respect to Ihi Matau, but, Ihi Matau, but it's, it's, it's part of that, that story and I think has been um, an important part of that story and putting pressure on government. Um, more domestically, I think you see arguments around, again, specific issues around general issues being framed with the declaration. It comes up and is then debated um, in Parliament that way. Uh, you see it in the courts. Um, so there are a number of cases where um, Māori have, have referenced the declaration. And we've seen our Supreme Court, our highest court, uh, refer to the declaration on a, on a number of occasions. It won't necessarily determine the outcome, but it is um, considered influential in how we might interpret um, the common law. So how you might, um, if there's say two interpretations and which one do you prefer, you might prefer say a declaration consistent one, at least that's the indication. A lot of this work is quite, is quite, is quite nascent. Um, in terms of a, a more globally around the world, so you see examples of this in different um, places. I'm, I, I'll let Dominic talk more about um, Australia, but um, because he's based there and, and probably more intimately involved, particularly being in Canberra. But um, you see the declaration being influential in the current constitutional recognition discussions that are going on there, um, which have a, a colleague who worked um, with me and others and during the declaration negotiations, Megan Davis is very key to, Professor Megan Davis is very key to that. and. Um, she brings a very declaration consistent or argument. And so I see compared to Aotearoa, um, it being used very politically in the Australian context. Um, I'm talking about the jurisdictions I know better, um, but of course it's different, used differently around the globe. But um, in Canada, um, so again being used in courts, again being used politically by what's called the Assembly of First Nations, which is the representative body of all um, uh, recognised, I guess, if you like, gang groups in Canada um, who are very actively using it to argue for greater autonomy um, and for greater regulatory space, for example. Um, and then um, in the north uh, of Europe, there's been some big wins with respect to Sami rights um, recently, both with respect to um, uh, uh, herding of reindeer and identification of who is Sami and who can identify as Sami in order to have specific rights as Indigenous peoples, that's been brought to the international level and then taken seriously. Um, it's more, I think it's more difficult to, to the declaration has, has more greater resistance in, in Asia, and we've seen that in many, in many ways. Um, but for some Indigenous groups, for example, in the Philippines, they've been able to use um, the declaration to, to with respect to, more, to, to argue for more land rights, equally I knew this is a this is a very moving situation, I, or, or very current contemporary um, situation in Japan, where the international um, influence has been very um, strong in, 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 in helping recognition of um, Ainu and, and um, yeah. So that's just a, there's more, a lot more to be said there, but um, we could talk more on that. But um, it would be good to hear from Dominic too. Great, thanks for that, Claire. Um, so much depth there, and hopefully we can share some links where where our audience can hear more about those um, cases. 
Uh, we'll hand over to you, Dominic, and thank you also for mentioning the Waitangi Tribunal and some of the uh, health claims that people have put forward there. Um, mm. Dominic, what more can you add to Claire's court at all? Yeah, well, um, the Parliament of British Columbia uh, late last year passed legislation um, saying that it would implement the declaration. Uh, it's not clear, though, on what exactly the Parliament means by that. Mm. And um, I, I guess we'll see, well, we're starting to get a, a not so positive sense of that already with um, there being um, disputes about a, the construction of a gas pipeline through um, First Nations territory and um, the legislation doesn't seem to be helping terribly much there, but uh, it, it may do in time that that argument still has a, a, a little way to go. Um, but the other thing too is that there's to be, I think, an annual report to Parliament um, on the, the progress of this legislation. So over time, um, I guess we'll be able to track what, what's happening or, or, or not and just how, how significant um, the declaration is, is becoming on, over the course of, of um, British Columbian politics. Um, one of the interesting things, though, um, was that the, um, the resource extraction lobby, the mining industry, actually supported this legislation on the grounds that it would bring certainty. Because, as Claire alluded to earlier, one of the uh, points of controversy or particular controversy for states when the declaration was being negotiated was um, the proposal that Indigenous peoples should have the right to provide free, uh, prior and informed consent before any kind of resource extraction could take place over their lands. And um, sometimes, of course, First Nations groups are, are happy with that. They're able to negotiate um, terms of, of access with the um, mining company that is, is mutually beneficial. Sometimes, of course, they're, they're not. And um, whether in those cases there should be an absolute right to say no or, or, or not is um, a, a point of controversy. So the British Columbian mining industry said, well, the declaration provides a framework for certainty for negotiation and so on. But they might change their view as soon as an Indigenous group says no, of course, and, and that'll be interesting to monitor. In, in Australia, um, again, as this clear noted, there is a, um, a debate that's been going on for, for many, many years about um, whether or not the constitution should be amended to recognise Indigenous peoples in some way. And of course, um, recognition could be very superficial or it could be very significant. And uh, there are all sorts of opinions in between those two extremes that, that people are debating. But what um, there seems to be fairly significant agreement among Indigenous nations in Australia is, is two things. Firstly, that um, uh, recognition needs to be given effect through treaties. And, and secondly, that a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament, so not a voice in parliament akin to the, the Māori seats, for example, but a separate body that would uh, have the authority to, to speak on Indigenous people's behalf to the parliament and therefore to the public. Um, so those are the two things that are being uh, uh, worked on at the moment. The, um, the voice to Parliament is a, a, a federal government matter, and the federal government is really not interested, nor is it interested in engaging with, with treaties with Indigenous nations. But in Victoria and the Northern Territory, uh, treaty negotiations are at their very, very early stages. Of, of negotiation and certainly the declaration, um, one would think, would, would inform those discussions in, in potentially quite significant and, and far-reaching ways. Um, and I might, might just mention one case recently where I think the declaration could have had significant influence but perhaps didn't. Um, the Australian government, as people are aware, is taking, maybe aware, is taking a very hard line approach to the deportation of 
non-citizens who um, commit crimes, often fairly, fairly minor crimes. I think um, a sentence of 12 months imprisonment is the, the threshold at which one becomes liable for deportation. Um, there was a case of a um, person with one Indigenous parent, uh, Indigenous Australian parent who was born in New Zealand and another in Papua New Guinea who uh, committed crimes that the Minister of Immigration decided were incompatible with Australian values or something and tried to deport them. Uh, this was taken to the High Court and um, the court was asked to consider the argument that um, indigeneity creates a particular kind of belonging that is quite separate from citizenship of the state, is irrelevant to citizenship and is not dependent on citizenship. So you can belong to Australia without being a citizen of Australia. And, and the government, of course, opposed that argument. And I think the declaration could well have helped progress that argument in that um, it makes references to the right to culture. And I, I think it's a, a fairly logical step to argue that if there's a right to culture, there's a right to access to the place where that culture exists and where that culture is, is lived. Um, and although the case was won in the High Court, it didn't make reference to that argument, which I, I found quite interesting. I think it would have strengthened the argument. Perhaps. Excellent. I think that, that's a great point to make. Thank you, Dominic. Um, you've talked about some of the, the challenges. Um, I wanted to pick up on some of the enablers um, or the conditions that support uh, Indigenous peoples to have some success around affirming their rights. Um, so you mentioned the treaties, you mentioned a separate body, perhaps you also mentioned some of the annual reports um, in British Columbia. Um, I might cut to you, Claire. Could you talk a little bit more about some of the conditions that support um, some success for Indigenous peoples around um, using the declaration? Yeah, sure. Um, so from my perspective and engagement with the declaration, I think it works best when Indigenous groups use it and coalesce around it um, as part of a usually a bigger strategy to achieve a particular end, be it with respect, as I say, to health, to, I just saw a comment with, with respect to local representation on, um, or with res at regional government level. Mm. Um, so when, when there's a good deal of, um, I guess, political buy-in by Indigenous peoples to really push it, you have to have, of course, a, a, a level of um, openness from, from the government, but the two things um, often go hand in hand. So if you push a little bit, then the government has to respond, is made aware of the declaration, and, and, the, and it snowballs a little bit. At least that's an argument that I've made uh, before in, in my own research and writing. Um, so I think, yeah, really getting Indigenous peoples behind it is, is, is a key because government won't probably lead that process. So an example would be um, since 2015, the Iwi Tears Forum has had a particular, um, I guess, kind of working group on the declaration, the independent monitoring mechanism, which um, has used its own offices, if you like, to um, each year do an assessment of where New Zealand sits um, with respect to the declaration, how compliant New Zealand is, if you like, and has submitted that to what's called the UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is a body that sits in um, Geneva and is probably the key body with respect to the declaration, I would say, at the international level. And then as a result, the government has had to respond to those reports, um, not necessarily particularly willingly or um, because it hasn't wanted to, but the fact that then ministers start hearing about the declaration and start, you know, uh, having to respond to this allegation that there is a breach of the declaration. Um, and then I think it's partly because of that kind of action that the government by cabinet did decide to establish or come up with a national, has decided to come up with a national action plan to uh, realise the declaration and then establish this working group um, last year to 
assist it and how it might do that. So I think that that period, that period of time over the last five years, drawing again, of course, on 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 advocacy of Māori um, for a long time, um, that's one. That's that's really a way that you get movement um, happening. Excellent. Uh... And Heather did make the comment that she's really keen to get some insight into um, this report from the working group. But um, yeah, so hopefully we can tease some about it. something out of here. Cool. Okay. You. <laughs> um, Dominic, did you have anything to add there? No, not on that. Thank you. Okay, I just um, I think that's a really great example, Claire, of of some of the the other work that goes on before um, drawing on the declaration, but also after and how it's part of a long-term strategy. So thanks for that. Um, what are some of the limitations that you both see in um, the utilization of the declaration? Or, yeah, could, could you, we'll cut to you, Dominic. Yeah, um, I think the, the, the overarching one for me is that um, the declaration is very much focused on the obligations of states. So this is, you know, what states must do to ensure that, you know, Indigenous people can enjoy better health or, or better education or so on. And while that's important, it does overshadow, I think, to some extent, the capacities of Indigenous peoples, because ultimately, if there's a right to self-determination, that means there's a right to exercise political capacities the capacities of citizenship, for example. And maybe it's fair enough that those are worked out or codified in, in other places. But I, I suppose given it's a, a UN document, one should expect um, the concept of state and what states do what and, and so on to, to feature prominently. But um, when we're thinking about implementing it perhaps or what it means it's important i think that we keep track of or, or, or keep conscious of the fact that political making a political difference having political authority ultimately comes from one's own capacities ability i thought you've just cut out there dominic uh unfortunately Oh, no, there you are. Could you um, finish off your sentence? I don't, I don't know at what point okay, I cut it out. Okay, it cut out about three seconds ago. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, well, I, I, I'll just say that, yeah, I, I, I think the, the, the concept of Indigenous people's authority and capacities as political agents is perhaps not strongly as it, as it might be. Uh, but as I said, perhaps that's something that properly belongs elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other criticisms that people often make, which is a criticism I, I don't accept, but I, I do understand where it comes from, is that uh, the declaration can be seen as a, a, a liberal document. Basically, it's underpinned by liberal political values of um, freedom and liberty and so on. But when liberalism thinks about liberty, it usually thinks about it as an individual right. And sometimes it's very good as a, at understanding that um, there's a relationship between individual rights and collective rights. Sometimes it's not so good at, at making that understanding. And some people have criticized the declaration for imposing liberal values on non-liberal communities. And um, I know that you know, a lot of Indigenous actors and the Indigenous women's movement around the world has strongly criticised that argument on the grounds that what it has really been used for in some places has been to countenance male violence against women as traditional cultural practices. And um, it's a really complicated uh, debate but that's the context in which it exists. But certainly some people think, no, nah, this is not, this is imposing ways of doing politics and a set of values that are not inherently indigenous. Therefore, we don't want to go with it. Um, Professor Irene Watson at the University of South Australia has written quite strongly on that. And um, 
like I said, there's very, very strong uh, female indigenous critiques in particular that, that counter that argument. Um, so that, that's an interesting one to, to have a look at and, and think about. Excellent. Thank you for that. And um, it'll be great if we can have some links to those um to explore more of those critiques and counter critiques as well. Um, some people are saying that there are some problems with your internet connection, Dominic, but I think that they have uh, righted themselves. So I think we'll keep going. But if our audience does have any more problems, we might have to switch to voice only for you. But we're going to keep going because I think it only cut out twice. Um, okay. Now, I'm going to ask you both, um, as time is ticking on, um, what are your greatest accomplishments in working with the Indigenous Rights and the Declaration? We'll cut to you, Claire. Thanks, Papa. I'm not. I, I'm just want to add a few comments okay, to what Donna said. If that's okay. Um, yep. um, so that that sort of tension between also that, that Dominic's picking up on the lib, the liberal tension is one that is. Um, concerns me in, in many ways, um, and it's also a, a broader tension between human rights, uh, which are often perceived to be liberally also focused on the individual as, a, as opposed to the, um, to the collective. One thing I would say about the Declaration and what was really unique was the level of Indigenous people's participation in the drafting of it mm. as collectives also as, a, as individuals, but that there was, it, it is a different type of instrument um, to a lot of the more um, individually focused treaties, say, on, on civil and political rights. So we ha can't forget that Indigenous agency and it's the rights of peoples, it's collective, collectives' rights. There's a lot more that can be said there, but some of that's a bit academic, so let's not worry too much about that at this point. But you also talked about what are the other limitations, and, and one, one is who determines what it means. Um, to get, this is true of, of a lot of uh, international negotiations is that to get agreement you have to have a certain degree of ambiguity in there so that people can think that it means different things and that's quite deliberate right so some of the language around lands territories and resources can be interpreted is open for interpretation so one of the issues that i see is well then who's got authority to interpret it um, and indigenous peoples have to be careful that it, it's not just left up to state entities like courts, like the executive, etc., who are then taking a limited interpretation. So that that's a constant issue. Um, now, talking about so what uh, then I will I'm happy to talk about the Declaration Working Group. I know the question was about what are our own accomplishments. Um, so I'll just turn to that first, and you can ask me then as you like on the Declaration Working Group. But uh, oh wow! Uh, the, the, my own compliment. I mean, not, none of my of my own at all. I think, you know, this is the declaration has always been a um, collective effort, and no no body can claim any particular personal accomplishment. I've been honoured, and it has been a highlight of my career to be to to participate with so many wonderful people like. At home, Moana Jackson, Aroha Mead, Fireman Hinnick, and so on to push this kaupapa forward. And then at the international stage, with you know Willie Littlechild, with McDodson, with I, I don't, I mean, I don't want to name anybody actually because I'm just going to get myself in trouble. But to be just a small part of that um, is has has and remains um, incredibly rewarding. The 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 one thing that I tried to do personally again, but also with with others is. Um, to work with anyone who wants to engage with the declaration to try and um, show them how to sh create light to say that you can use it and this is how you might like to if you've got a particular issue so just to be um, there for any and all who are interested in doing that and to continue to put some pressure on government but again that's always done collectively so no no personal accomplishments but um, just a great honour of working with many over the last couple of decades since 1998. Dominic, um, yeah, please add some corridor to um, Claire's um, corridor there. Yeah, well, I, I guess um, one's a, uh, whether what one does is an accomplishment or not is for, for others to determine. Um, but I, I do hope that my forthcoming book will 
make a contribution to the debate. I, I don't set out to tell people how it is or how it should be, but I, I hope it's uh, something that stimulates further thought and that, that people find it useful in that respect. Um, you know, um, the declaration is, is complicated and contested. Um, and if I can, through my book, help to bring a little bit of clarity or a particular perspective, perhaps, to, to that, then um, that would be an accomplishment, I suppose. But uh, we'll wait and see what the readers think. Thanks, Dominic. Um, and I just want to, Mihi, to um, some of the students that are listening in and who have, um, who send you their, their uh, well wishes and um, are interested in the quarter or in a Think some of your students care. Uh, I wanted to ask you what more can we be doing to embed Indigenous rights um, within the UN system? Claire. Yeah, within the UN system, that's hard because, um, particularly in COVID 19, because um, <laughs> you can't get to many of these venues and, and like, um, most places, the kānohi, ki te kānohi, is the most important and effective way of mm -hmm. affecting um, change. But um, embed, embedding the declaration in the international system, a real so that that presupposes, and I and I agree with this that there's a real problem in ensuring that the declaration is central to all international activity and in politically and regulation. So be it climate change, be it biodiversity be it trade, which is a big, it has been a big issue for us, obviously, in Aotearoa um, for a while. Um, so it's been present, I think, and always raising it, and, and you see in the climate change some, some recent kind of wins because there's been greater participation in business and human rights. We've seen um, some uh, really important norms being developed that, uh, sourced in Indigenous peoples' rights and concerns about how business is interacted in our communities, with respect to oil and gas, as one of one one area. Um, so, but but being there is really important, and always raising the declaration in all these different spaces, um, because it's it's true of the international system as a whole that um, particular siloed areas go off and do their own thing. So trade, for example, you might think has got nothing to do with Indigenous people's rights and not even open to any argument around Indigenous people's rights. But when trade involves um, facilitating business to come in or, or to make it easier, and, and that can then lead to um, often serious issues for Indigenous peoples, if it's their resource, for example, if we're talking about our coda or our um, fish or, our, or, or whatever it is, um, having free trade can can be problematic, right? And then who who says who can deal with what resource? So, so making that that can be really hard to make sure that that happens. Um, and it's an ongoing battle because the international regulatory regime is massive. It's my even it's mind blowing. Um, so, yeah, the other problem that that has led to is that I think um, for many Indigenous is that they've got caught up or they, they, we spread too thinly. Mm. Right? So the movement has got only so many people and only so many people can can access resources to be in all these places. Um, so it makes it really, it, it's, it's tricky. But Excellent. Thanks, Claire. Uh, I think that was a really important point about the different, the range of fora that in which we can uh, do some advocacy for Indigenous rights. Um, and we often don't think about, you know, those forums such as trade. Uh, Dominic, did you have anything to add to that, embedding um, rights within the UN? The, the UN is a, a state system. So whenever there's an Indigenous voice, uh, within the UN system, it's really by, by negotiation with those states, which, which makes it difficult, of course. Um, uh, the declaration and we use the treaty and, and other instruments in different parts of the world to um, 
make the state look a bit different to make we are having some problems with your connection um keep talking dominic or we will try and hopefully fingers crossed it it keeps itself out okay so what, what, what i was trying to say was that um while, while the un is a state system mm -hmm. and indigenous voice within that system is really dependent on the willingness of the states to, to admit that um one of the And, and can be used alongside the treaty and various other instruments. Um, sorry, I just noticed that you stopped the video there. I was wondering what the message was coming up on my screen. Um, but um, so strengthening indigenous participation within the state. Uh, there's a, a very succinct expression of what they could mean in Australia uh, by an indigenous commentator and. Um, of the papers talking about constitutional reform and suggesting that what was needed was to bring a bit of blackness into this white document, i.e. the constitution. So making the constitution look a bit more like indigenous people, reflecting indigenous values and indigenous presence more strongly. And um, that's a, a very lengthy process, some might even argue a, a naive and unrealistic process, but making the state look a bit different, uh, making it lose some of its colonial character, um, then means it's a different voice that's presented at the UN and that state's organisation, for example. And, um, you know, obviously things like the increasing... Uh, ..for example, and New Zealand is an important example of that. Um, you know, Māori ministers do address the UN, for, for example. Um, so I think looking at ways of using the declaration and other instruments to diminish the colonial character of the state, the colonial appearance of the state, I think is uh, one of the things that the declaration perhaps will help people to do over time. And, and that's important, I think. Excellent. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, we are going to have to wrap up now. Um, there were many other things that I, I think it would have been great to talk about, and one of those is a growing um, group of rangatahi or taiohi or young people that are getting really involved with the, the declaration and in uh, Indigenous rights. So perhaps that can be part two of this webinar next year or, or later on. Mm -hmm. um, Claire, did you have any key documents or links or perhaps something about the voluntary fund that you would meet, want to mention before we wrap up? Yeah, sure. And also just to Taitoko, your idea of involving um, or having a particular session on langatahi because I think that is one of the most exciting things going on in, in Aotearoa. Um, yes, so just to mention the UN Voluntary Fund for Indigenous uh, Peoples that uh, provides travel grants. Hmm. We're a little bit slow at the moment, as you can imagine. Um, travel grants to uh, Indigenous peoples globally to raise human rights issues before um, expert mechanism, the permanent forum, recently business and human rights to treaty bodies in the GA and that kind of thing. So that's if anyone wants to get involved, look up the UN Voluntary Fund for Indigenous Peoples. Um, you can get there and um, it's a relatively um, easy internet process to internet-based process to apply um yeah i'll just i might just leave it there participate 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 use it Kilda. Um, dominic any any last words very briefly oh, i just endorse what claire just said you use it think about um how it might be helpful to particular issues that that people and oh um you know, there's a, a lot of research done on this, uh, legal developments and so on. Courts are um, referring to it, as, as Claire said. So um, it, it's a rapidly evolving field of, of law and politics, um, one of, of considerable potential, not notwithstanding the, the constraints. Kia ora, Dominic. Uh, and we're going to have to wrap it up. Thank you for your comments. Um, people are very appreciative of your corridor today. Uh, I'd like to, obviously, mihi to you both for giving us your time. I know you're both busy. Um, also, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa. 
Whakarongomaina. Thank you to everybody who's listening in. Thank you to our organising committee and to the sponsors. Also to Adrian Te Patsu, our moderator, and to Jeff, our technician. Uh, just in closing, I'd like to say kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu te moana, kia tere te kārohirohi i mua, i mua i tō koutou kuarahi. May peace be widespread, may the sea glisten like greenstone, and may the shimmer of light guide you on your way. Tēnā tātou katsua. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.